In this lecture, I want to discuss one of the most important uh, philosophers who's still working, uh, still alive. Uh, his, uh, his work ranges over many areas in uh, social theory. Uh, it ranges in areas of philosophy, linguistics, and so on. And uh, that's Jürgen Habermas. Habermas is one of the uh, last great defenders of rationalism in a period in philosophy in which uh, rationalism is not held in very high esteem. Uh, in many ways, uh, Habermas is an outgrowth of uh, one of the figures that we discussed last time, uh, namely Herbert Marcuse uh, and the Frankfurt School. That would include Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer. Uh, Habermas was, in fact, uh, Adorno's uh, graduate assistant. And uh, uh, so the original project that Jürgen Habermas set himself was to reformulate the kinds of theories being worked on by Marcuse, by Horkheimer, and by Adorno. In particular, his first venture was to reformulate their distinction between traditional theory, understood as both philosophy and science, both, both as opposed to what they called critical theory a theory whose interest was in the emancipation of human beings. Now this may sound uh, a little sort of fancy Dan. The whole attempt was a way to attempt to reformulate Marxism in a setting appropriate for the late 20th century. So this is a very important school of thinkers of which Habermas is in a way the last <laughs> and leading exponent. Uh, in a, it, it's clear, I mean, in his, especially in his later work, that he's moved a considerable distance away from Marxism. That's, uh, that would be obvious, I think, for almost any thinker in the late 20th century. Uh, what I want to do is to start and move you through in 45 minutes from Marcuse's uh, uh, rather exuberant uh, radicalism, his youthful radicalism. I want to move from there through Habermas's attempt to reformulate that project while keeping in mind our central theme, which is the self under siege. I mean, what was important to Marcuse about social systems was not what would be uh, important to the average economist, which was, uh, uh, you know, maximizing utilities. What was important to Marcuse about economies and other things was their effect on the lives of selves. How did they cause the self to be able to construct itself. In other words, uh, uh, how was the economic and cultural impact of that lived out in human beings? And I discussed a whole series of pathologies of both the period in which he wrote and that uh, pathologies that have continued down to the present day. So that was Marquise's interest was in liberating people from that unnecessary part of life suffering. Not death, you know, I mean, I think we, you know, again, I don't think we can get around that. But there's a vast difference between living to be 90 and being uh, uh, well-educated and fed and relatively healthy and dying at the age of three weeks in Biafra with flies in your eyes. There's a significant difference there, a difference that people have found worth fighting over and worth dying for. So Habermas attempts to, to reformulate this project he begins with a distinction that's central throughout uh, his early work between labor and what he initially called interaction, but which I think can safely be called by now communication. And his argument was a fundamental argument. He said, if you look at the human species, it has fundamental human interests. One is to reproduce its life through labor, in other words, through work. That's a fundamental interest of the human species. You don't do that one, and sort of nothing else gets off the ground. It's a fundamental human interest. Habermas locates a second fundamental human interest, and this one is different, quite different for him, in communication. In other words, in the, in the, in the interest that human beings have, and it's a deeply seated interest, in communicating with one another. If you think about this, it would be required for everything from any kind of social bonding without which even human life in the anthropological sense wouldn't be possible and so on. It's a fundamental interest, not just in communication, this is important, 
but in understarted and clear communication. That's our fundamental human interest. Because we have a fundamental human interest in understarted communication, we need to understand what Habermas calls systematically distorted communication. And I, I will be on to that in just a minute. First, I, I want to briefly lay aside the part of uh, the older critical theory and of Marx that Habermas leaves alone as he reformulates his project. The labor half of the distinction is pretty much left over to the uh, standard economic accounts draw that grow out of his tradition in the early Habermas. Labor is understood as a kind of monological or instrumental endeavor. You know, in other words, it's an instrumental endeavor driven by the imperatives of efficiency and so on. It's an instrumental endeavor, and he, he uh, defines it as being monological. Uh, he also says ab about it something that's sort of banally true. Uh, he calls it a productive endeavor. It's the endeavors surrounding production as opposed to those surrounding communication. Communication is, according to Habermas, by its very nature, dialogic. Okay? And what Habermas wants to locate, because he knows that there are traditional disciplines in, throughout the history of Western or India, Indo-Western, Indo-European uh, uh, societies and Western civilization that deal with problems both in the area of labor and communication. So I say in, in the area of labor and instrumental reason, we have the sciences, and in the area of communication, we have the humanities, which are supposed to enlighten us about dialogue, tell us more about how, how to talk to one another. For Habermas, we really form ourselves as selves in both dimensions. But we could not, for Habermas, possibly become subjects, selves, without the communicative dimension of dialogue. So he would utterly reject a sort of empiricist account like David Hume would give, or like Skinner in a more modern period would give, that we could become human simply by looking at patches of blue and listening to pieces of phonetic sounds. Because for him, we become selves in much the way we do for, uh, for Mead, the great American sociologist. We become selves in our, in our interaction with other selves. In other words, it, it's by seeing how other people respond to the things that we say that we cue in on who we are. We may adjust it and so on. I mean, this is, seems to me, at one level, an obvious point. I mean, this seems to me obvious. Uh, but uh, you'd be surprised it's not obvious in philosophy. Now, the most uh, controversial part of the early Habermas' work is his claim that the, that the human race has a third interest. And of course, his whole argument will hinge on this. And that's the critical interest in emancipation. That the human race really has an interest that's fundamental. By that he means an interest that's so important that we need it in order to survive. To free ourselves from both the distortions of instrumental reason and the distortions of what could be called, and will later in his work be called, communicative reason. We need to free ourselves from these distortions. In other words, for the human race to survive, we need to learn to labor more humanely to the extent that we can manage that. And we all, but, but uh, in, the, in the focus of, of his early work, uh, perhaps more important still, we need to be able to communicate with one another freely and clearly, and that without doing so, uh, our chances of a long survival are not great. So throughout this, this work, you can see in a way that we have first a reformulation of a kind of Marxian side of the account of human beings in Habermas's labor part of the distinction. Now, for, he, for his communication model, we have a, what, what I would call a hermeneutic base for it. By hermeneutic here, again, I mean interpretive. And the, the philosopher he discusses, Diltai and others, where he says the great art of the humanities, if you will, the way they further communication is through the interpretation of texts. And I'll be talking a lot today about the interpretation of texts.
because in the humanities, when you get right down to it, that's what we do. Let me say it in a, in a simple West Texas way. We read books. We read books. We tell our students what they mean, you know. This is what we do for a living. And so don't let hermeneutics throw you because it's a big word. It means interpretation of texts. Now, don't think that this is some fancy Dan uh, academic exercise. A lot of people have died because they read a book the wrong way. I want you to think of the history of the world's great religions. One could write a book called The History of Heresies and retitle it The History of Misreadings That Led to Death. Now, I don't mean to be cynical, it's just obvious that reading a book and interpreting a certain way can get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, similarly, those familiar with the law know that just any reading of the Constitution won't work. I mean, uh, Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion, except if Rick decides, me, if I decide I want to start a religion of my own that includes, you know, slaughtering innocent babies with oyster knives, in which case my reading of the Constitution will lead me into deep trouble. I, I can support my reading. I mean, the Constitution says no law. It must mean that. I'll be literal about it the way that some people are about the Bible. I'll go, no law means no law. So whatever my religion, be it baby slicing or whatever, but uh, I'm afraid that that, uh, that won't be considered a reasonable reading. In fact, I'm sure of it, and don't think that I'm suggesting it as a possible religion to any of you out there in, in the world of video. I'm not. Uh, so this is the field of interpretation. But this is not enough for Habermas to have this field of instrumental reason within which science and technology and human labor advance the world technologically. And this f uh, field of interpretation where humanity advances itself through conversations in an ethical and in an aesthetic way, there's a third human interest. And this is, of course, crucial to his argument because like Marcuse and Adorno and Marx and Freud and Nietzsche and all the people we, that I've discussed, Sartre, he has a fundamental interest in human liberation, the liberation from unnecessary constraints to our freedom and to our full development. So he wants to show where that interest lies and, and where does it come from. Well, he looks around and he can find only one model and it's unsurprisingly Freud because in a way, when you reformulate these things, you always sort of seem to fall back on the earlier models in one way or another, updated, jazzed up in some way. So the model he uses for, for uh, uh, distorted communication, that corresponds to what Marx called ideology. Those remarks that we make that reflect the interests of classes other than the ones we belong to. Those remarks that we make that are shaped by that truism of Marx to me, which is that in every age, the ruling ideas are the ideas of the ruling classes. That to me is just a truism. It's not even a theory. And I think any fair reading of philosophy will bear it out. In every age, the ruling ideas are the ideas of the ruling classes. And if you read the, the, the Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle, it has independent interest. But basically, it's a handbook on how good Athenian gentlemen should be good Athenian gentlemen. I mean, that still is interesting because people today would be, probably be better off behaving that way. But what the hell, it still shows the ruling interest and so on. Now, according to Habermas, uh, what replaces ideology in his model is what he calls systematically distorted communication. Uh, he doesn't give many examples. This is a really bad habit German philosophers have, is to make complex arguments and then not give you a damn example. One, so you're just lost wondering what is he talking about. Well, I think he has in mind blocks between communication uh, that, for example, uh, you're having a trade union meeting. Let's use solidarity for an example. That ought to tickle people in America, even though if we had a, an organization like Solidarity in America, it wouldn't tickle us. But since it's over in Poland, I think we can praise it. 
<laughs> you know, trade unions, <laughs> one of the funniest things I, I ever remember is Reagan praising solidarity, and then I thought, well, I wonder how he'd like a trade union that large in this country with those kind of demands. I don't think he would have been praising it. But in any case, uh, let's, let's talk about a, a, a dialogue among them. And, and it, it doesn't have to be otherworld. It could be the kind of dialogue you could have among any trade unionist. Well, you know, it's a right to work state. So we don't have a chance. Well, for Habermas, this falls under the model he wants of systematically distorted communication because it's sort of a flat statement. It cuts off debate, you know, and, it, and debate needs to go on. Moreover, it passes that famous test of ideology, and that's when you ask yourself if what you believe is in the interest of other people for you to believe it. In other words, I always suspect a belief if, if I hold it, and I go, well, you know, the very powerful would love for me to believe that. Maybe I should rethink it because I don't know exactly where all my ideas come from. Uh, I have an idea many of them come from the people who control the means and the dissemination of information and communication. Okay, so he looks for a model where systematically distorted communication is overcome, and he finds it in Freud's practice of symptoms, of removing symptoms in the situation between an analyst and a patient. And in that situation, what you get is not an interpretation. In other words, the patient doesn't say something, and then Freud interpret it, right? The patient just babbles on and on and on and on and on. This is not a normal interpretive situation. There are a couple of differences. Unlike trying to read a text, it's a situation where the, the goal is practical. In other words, it's to cure the person, to make them stop having the symptom. So it's got a practical goal. Interpretation frequently will not. Another difference that's, uh, that is very important for Habermas is that Freud succeeded to a certain extent in develop developing a practice that did remove blocks to communication. Okay, you have your patient babbling away, sort of the talking cure style of revolution is what we've got going here. You have a, your patient babbling away, and the only way you can bring this uh, uh, ana analysis to a conclusion is when the uh, therapist intervenes, presents a possible interpretation, but it will not work until what happens? Both parties agree to it. In other words, it won't be your analysis until you go, yeah, I keep biting people because, and then you go, uh-huh. And when you and the therapist agree, you have then all the sort of confirmation that your previous behavior and our communication was distorted. It was distorted. Now, uh, that's the model he wants to work with, and he thinks we have an interest in removing these distortions to communication so that, so that we can have uh, what Sidney Greenstreet says, calls in the Maltese Falcon, clear speaking and plain understanding. This is a, a, a good, this is something civilization needs. Well, this forces him to another level of argument, of course, because if what you want to remove as opposed to ideologies or if what you want to counter are ideologies, if instead of that, You've, re, you've reconstructed this as systematically distorted communication. The next question someone may ask you is this. What in the devil would undistorted communication look like? In other words, now you need some kind of account of communication undistorted. The reason is that our communication is nearly always distorted. Have you ever noticed that? They're little Take a transcription of any conversation and you'll notice there are gaps in it, misspoken words, misunderstandings. The materiality of language is filled with these anomalies and with these mistakes. And I even have to say along the Freudian dimension, uh, certain uh, sexual jokes and so on, many sort of what you would call distortions of communication appear along other dimensions besides just the dimension uh, that would, re would reflect on human labor, for example. Many other dimensions, you get, to get distortions as well. 
Habermas here, and this is a bold thing for him to do, I want to point this out, in the, in the late 20th century, after all I told you that was going wrong, and after what looked like the destruction of reason itself in just, you know, in, in a society of subjects that have become kind of humanoids, it is quite a valiant thing to try to defend human reason, you know, in any form. And he does try to do so in, in this limited form. He wants to mark off a sphere of understarted communication that can serve as the basis for a concept of what he calls communicative rationality. Now, before we get into that argument, I want to explain why he does that, other than what I've already said, other than the reasons internal to his early work. He wants to do it to untangle the entwinement I talked about last time between enlightened thought and barbaric action that we've seen since the history of modernity. In other words, we've seen, on the one hand, people making these individually monological instrumental decisions based on instrumental reason, leading to these horrible paradoxes. And for Habermas, the trick is not uh, to give up on modern life. It's not to fall beneath the level of civilization reached by capitalism. The trick is to disentangle enlightenment from terror, mythology, and barbarism. That, clearly, we haven't succeeded in doing in the 20th century. That's why I spent a lot of time in the first four lectures discussing, or some time discussing, uh, the experience of fascism and its effect on the earlier thinkers we talked about. Because fascism was the proof that enlightenment and technology had not led to the liberation of human beings as the great philosophers of the enlightenment thought it would. Instead, it had led to Dachau, and, so, and this was not its destination. And this was not what it, it, they, that the destination that had been hoped for it. You know, the 19th century believed in progress. Adorno once cynically remarked, there is no history that leads from slavery to freedom, but there is a history that leads from the slingshot to the megaton bomb. So what Habermas wants to do is to try to find a, a way to disentangle the, the more uh, distarting, barbaric uh, aspects of enlightenment from those that we clearly want to hang on to. In Habermas's opinion, there have been advances in modern life, and I, I don't think anybody would dispute this. The advances in modern life include one this simple. It is much better to have a toothache in 1993 than in 1493. That's simple. Whenever anyone asks me about this, I go, well, there's one. I'd in 1493, a toothache, if it's bad, you know, impacted, it's the end of your uh, theoretical work. It may be the end of your life. You get one now, you go to a dentist. That's, an, that's better. Not everything that's, that modernity has produced has been a disaster. Obviously. I mean, this is an obvious point. So the trick then is, as it were, to uh, 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 not throw out the baby with the bathwater, not throw out the advances of mod modernity when we are in the process of trying to clear up this distorted communication forms and these distortions to people's ways of life. Okay, that's the trick. So there's a lot, a lot riding on his argument uh, concerning systematically distorted communication. Well, Habermas holds, and this is the rationalist thesis, this is the Enlightenment part, that the, that, our, that the sentences that we utter, even from an early age, have, as it were, built into them the desire for consensus, for mutual understanding. That whether you consciously bring it to mind or not, when you speak a sentence, it has built into it if you're following my argument, built into it the desire that you be understood by others. In other words, it has the critical impulse already built into it, that impulse that you communicate with that other person if they're from a different class, if they're uh, from a different gender, 
You know, I mean, this is difficult. Men and women talking, different class, different race, different ethnic group. When you utter a sentence, Habermas says, built into that utterance, into that communication, as one of its conditions, is the desire for unconstrained understanding. Now you don't, when you say, pass me the salt, bring to mind a desire for universal unconstrained understanding. But he thinks it is built into the structure of languages, the desire to understand one another, the desire to have clear communication. He begins to lay out a series of conditions which time will force me to just run through very quickly for such communication. One, and this, of course, is what I like to call the equality provision. Undistorted communication would have a symmetry condition. Truly undistorted communication would have a symmetry condition like this. Everyone would have an equal opportunity to talk and to listen. Everyone would have an equal opportunity to talk and to listen. Let me try to explain why this is more politically interesting than it sounds. It means everyone has an equal right to command as to obey. That's a speech act. That's a communicative act. It means everyone has an equal right to question and to an answer. This symmetry condition has more political power than it seems at first. It is a very egalitarian principle. Habermas believes that we couldn't have undistorted communication without it. Now, I'll give, again, he doesn't, but I'll try to give examples to make it understandable. I know as a teacher that it's an important condition, but it's impossible to achieve in a classroom under these current social conditions because I have the power to grade a child and give him an F and keep him out of law school, even if his rich daddy sends me 500 letters. Because I have that power, I can't expect that student and I to communicate in an undistorted way because our communication is distorted by my power to judge what the student says. This is why the people who run operations, bosses, seldom get the undistorted truth about their situation. I also think, being a husband, that it's why husbands seldom get the truth about the relationship they have with their wives, their sons, their daughters, and so on. Because when you're in a relative position of power, the other person's aware of it too and of their role, and you cannot expect an undistorted communication. One not. And I, again, don't mean personally, but systematically distorted. This is systematically distorted. It's distorted by relations of unequal power. In a, if, if you're to be communicative, ra a communicatively rational, everyone has to have the same right to speak and be heard. I also need to give you a real-world example of that. And that would be something like the great early meetings of solidarity. I mean, Lech Walesa recognized people, but anybody could stick their hand up, union member or not. That was when they had crossed the line into a total revolution, and Lech Walesa... Uh, sure, he was recognizing people, but everyone had a right to do that, and it wasn't always him either, even though that was what was presented in our media. And that is, while not perfect, and we're not expecting the world ever to be perfect, neither is Habermas, this is a model of communication that is what you would call dialogic. You're dialoguing now, you're not monologuing. You may notice that this is based on a quite ancient idea. It's a Socratic ideal. When Socrates argues with an interlocutor, he never pulls the argument that, well, I'm more powerful than you, so you're wrong. As a matter of fact, one of the charms of Socrates is that he owns almost nothing and has almost no position. And the only force he expects you to recognize is the force that Habermas says is the only force a free human being can ever recognize. And that is that peculiar, strange, unforced force of the better argument. Habermas believes that much in rationality that we can change our minds if we hear a better argument. And a free person can do that without being ashamed of himself or herself. 
you know, if you're in a free and equal situation of communication and someone convinces you through a better argument, you go, well, I now believe differently, but not through distortion or anything, but through just that strange force that a person feels when they become convinced. They go, oh, gee, now I agree with that. That is the force that a free human can recognize according to Habermas. Okay, another uh, condition, and these, these are obvious conditions that arise, I mean obvious, that they can, each one can be disputed, and I will discuss philosophers later today who dispute everything I'm saying now. But I, I want to present Habermas's, since I, this is one of my main areas, I want to present his position as powerfully as I can. Habermas also thinks that in various dimensions we try to communicate in certain ways. For example, while we do occasionally lie, it belongs to Habermas to the structure of, say, instrumental reason in the sciences, that when we contribute to a discussion on that topic about what's in the world, what entities there are and how they behave, that we try to make our contribution to the conversation one that is true. Now this is the sort of linguistic reformulation of a, of a Kantian postulate. But no, I mean, it, in a way it's a piece of good advice. I mean, uh, if I was to say, I, I, you know, how should you talk? Well, try to be relevant. There's a relevant condi relevancy conditional, you know, built into speech. This is how, I, I mean, I, I, this Habermas gets some of this from Grice, and I'm adding a little as I go along. Make your, make your contribution to the conversation relevant. So if you're at Lech Walesa's trade union meeting, don't start discussing Harrison Ford's latest performance compared to Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's not relevant. So try to be relevant. True. Try to, try to make your uh, contribution one that is true. Doesn't mean you will, but try to, try to make one that's true. Uh, another condition built into to this, I, what Habermas has now called, be, begun to call the ideal speech situation the ideal speech situation. Well, why ideal? Well, because he realizes this is an idealization, that human beings won't be able to fully carry this out. But to the extent that we can, we will be engaging in communicative, in communicative reason. Try to be relevant, try to make your contribution one that's true, and see, and this is obvious to me too, try to make your contribution one that's sincere. When I think about that, I always think about an, an article written in philosophy that is a brilliant article that would be praised by all my colleagues, but it ended with the sentence, oh, by the way, I'm only joking. In a way, that one sentence would undo the whole article. I mean, it would be like, no matter how good the article, someone would go, well, what a, what a joke. I mean, this, is a, this guy's a class. No. Uh, the, the idea here is that when you contribute to, a, to a, a, what's called a reason conversation, that we expect, humans expect the contribution to be a sincere contribution. <coughs> and uh, let's see, the final one is a moral condition. And that's that we expect that you try to make your contributions to language ones that advance the cause of what is right. Now, there's no theory here of right other than the ones that you've just heard in the communication theory itself. It'd be wrong to be insincere. It would be wrong to, you know, lie. It would be wrong to violate the symmetry condition. It would be wrong and so on. Uh, uh, in, in, in fact, this is a quite thin moral theory. But come to think of it, when we tell our children, look, you ought to do this, what stands behind our ought is something implicit in language. Namely, that our children can depend on us, you know, sincerely telling them a moral truth. This is what, before, you know, earlier when I said we don't learn moral theories from philosophers, I didn't mean in this sense Habermas is talking about, because we do learn it in this sense. Habermas means that when mothers tell their children or fathers, don't lie, they mean it. They, it's, not, it's not distorted. They mean don't lie or don't whatever. This is, uh, 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 this is the ethical, as it were, dimension of language.
Now, he doesn't want us to confuse these various spheres. They all interplay in language. But for Habermas, and this is a, a, a tradition that goes back to Kant, these each represent different practical areas. Science, morality, art, and even religion all represent different value spheres. Each one will have certain conditions that will be much more important in it than in others. In the scientific sphere, truth conditions will be most important. In the ethical sphere, the conditions for what we ought, ought to call rightness or how one ought to behave will be most important. In the aesthetic sphere, sincerity conditions, Abermas says, are important, mainly because he wants everything to fit. I'm not sure that's true about beauty or not. I'm not sure we want the beautiful to also... Uh, our communication about it maybe shouldn't even be sincere, but it, these things need to fit. This is a German theory that needs to fit. Okay. Uh, well, it looks like we've replaced Marx now by ignoring the economy, which wouldn't, wouldn't please any of the coal miners in West Virginia. <laughs> Tried to replace it as a way of understanding ourselves in the world. And we have traded in the class struggle, which Marx took to be the, uh, the uh, driving force of history, for Freud's talking cure. Well, there are some obvious uh, criticisms raised by young Turks like myself in the early phase of his work, uh, namely that the class struggle is not uh, psychoanalysis writ large. The reason it's not is because workers have every reason to believe that their bosses are not prepared to engage in a process of undistorted communication with them. Now, a patient may believe about his analyst or her analyst that, that they're prepared to, especially at those rates. As Freud once said, if you don't pay, you don't get better. But I mean, at those rates, at those rights, uh, you know, uh, you can expect some sincerity and some give and take, but we have no reason to believe the class struggle is a kind of psychoanalysis writ large or that the struggle of human beings over ethnicity or of the struggle of women to find dignity and equality is some kind of an analytic process writ large. Habermas is aware of these objections and responds to them in several ways. Uh, the one that bothers him the most is the following, that his model is elitist, his model of communicative reason, which I have counterposed to all these pathologies to which it is addressed. When I mentioned all those pathologies uh, that, that the young people I know have and, uh, you know, anomie, in other words, meaninglessness and anxiety, dread, so on, you mention all of those. Well, those are all systematic distortions of communication that come out in the way they talk and interact, and the theory is addressed at those. But here's the problem. It's not just that this doesn't reconstruct Marxism, which is of little interest if it's not a true and interesting theory of the present age. The deeper problem is that it looks like an elitist theory. It looks like a theory that trades Marx's analysis of society as a giant factory for an analysis by Habermas of society as a giant seminar room. Have you noticed how all these conditions are the ones that ought to hold in a seminar? Everybody in a seminar should be relevant, concise, sincere, and make their contributions true. And it's not lost on any of Habermas's critics that he spent his whole adult life as a professor. So this is, the, the, uh, now, I don't want to just stomp on him with one of these West Texas ad hominem arguments here. Habermas responds in a, in a way quite movingly to this objection. He says, you have missed the point because what I'm talking about in communicative rationality is a process of enlightenment that includes all. Janitors, cooks, everybody includes us. It includes everyone. So we've missed its universality. But more importantly, and I think this is a beautiful quotation from Habermas, he says, in a process of enlightenment, there can only be participants. No analyst and patient. So in that way, the model was misleading originally. No Lech Valesa and the lead. No Clinton and the Clintonians. <laughs> 
no Ross Perot and United We Stand America, in a true process of enlightenment, there can only be participants. Now, that, stated that way, Habermas's uh, communication theory looks like a linguistic variant of anarchism, and I like it, <laughs> because it means that everybody gets a chance to talk. I enjoy that. So, uh, now, let me, uh, in the time remaining to me here, let me move a little further along uh, to how he's reformulated the theory, and he's had to under the force of various objections. Uh, and they've come from all kinds of people. I gave you the Marxist-style objections, but hermeneutic, or interpretive people in the humanities, didn't like his account of the humanities as limited either. In other words, they didn't like that account as it limited to a single interest, because they pointed out something that's come up in, in here several times, and that's that the sciences are also interpretive. And they went, look, the work of interpretation isn't just for us humanists, but everybody interprets. I mean, it was Galileo that said that the world was like this giant text and mathematics was its language. Well, that, the analogy of the world as a text is one that's very familiar to scientists. To read, as it were, and interpret is not something that's limited to books alone. Interpretation, in fact, may be one of the fundamental conditions for selfhood. One of the problems in the current situation with what I have called previously information overload and complexity may be the difficulty that gives us in interpreting everyday life situations. Because everyone, whether they know it or not, is always already an interpreter. When you stop at a stop sign, you've interpreted something already. Now you've done that without too much interpretive work. Red, in our country, means not only commie, it also means stop. You know, I mean, red means commie to me, means commie anarchist hippie type scum, but it also, when it's a light, means stop. Uh, acts of interpretation go on constantly, all around us, in all forms of conversation. There's, the, as it were, in our encounter with the world itself, we see some smoke down the road. We have to interpret, is it a wreck? Do I need to go another way? Uh, people who've lived together a long time and think they know each other well are still constant interpreters. My wife I, will, will see a certain look on my face, and it is a, it's interpreted. And, and I don't think correctly, but it, she, she just goes, and then we're off on something, you know? But I mean, this shows the ubiquity of interpretation in human life. I mean, in a certain way, one of the characteristics of what the self is, and one of the reasons it's under siege, is we're interpretive beings. And now, by the late 20th century, we're in a situation where interpretation has never been more difficult. Never been more difficult. One can, I mean, I can name artifacts that we've developed technologically that are almost completely close to interpretation, and I'll name one, although we attempt to interpret it. Television. Television tries to interpret itself to us, bypassing the upper brain functions and directly feeding into our minds. This is why I said, off camera between classes that Orwell was a, was a pied optimist. 1984 arrived in sort of the early 70s, and, uh, and, and, and Orwell's vision of a horrible future, which was a, a boot stomping on a human face forever, is a utopian image because he assumed there would be resistance and human faces, both of which may turn out to be false. So, I mean, 1984 is not a book that scares me anymore. I mean, it's, it's again, I, I know that last time uh, I outrageously said that, that Herbert Marcuse was the Norman Vincent Peale of the 60s. And now this time I've been forced to say that Orwell was an optimist, you know, a sort of my corollary to his little uh, cautionary tale. Well, in the face of all this, I think that the, the tribute I want to pay to Habermas and what interested what interested me about Habermas's work was to try to defend reason 
in spite of all of these things that I've said. You may notice that I gave a, a, an account of cynical reason, but I didn't give you an account of, 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 what I, of how I might stand vis-a-vis -vis it, and I've said a lot of cynical things. Well, what I admire in Habermas is the attempt, without being a complete idiot, to try to, to develop an account of reason that is, runs against cynical reason. It does say to us, we can speak to one another. We can have processes of enlightenment. We can learn, learn to say what is true to one another. Now, it is true that this is endangered in ways that he didn't discuss in his early work, which he does in his later. His later work, especially a very large book called Theory, uh, Theories of Communicative Action, uh, Habermas once again returns to the attempt of defending this idea of communicative reason, and he adds, uh, he adds many more problems to it. First, he recognizes something that I've already pointed out, which I think he always recognized, but he, he again, in typically German intellectual fashion, he needed time to write a 4,000-page book on it. When I, in my book, when I gave an account of his book, I did it in 31 pages, and people said, well, that's too short, and I went, no, his is too long. But he realizes by the time of his mature work that money and power as abstract systems to start our everyday life in the ways we talk. And that those systems will have to be, as it were, harmonized before we'll be in a position within which it will really be possible to speak to one another face to face. And I hate to be quasi-theological, but perhaps if we could do that, then we wouldn't see through a glass darkly. You know, maybe, maybe then we would have a way to find our way out of this dilemma, which I have called this terrible entwinement of enlightenment and terror, barbarism, and myth. And if nothing else, Habermas's project uh, offers us one powerful voice that, that argues that such a possibility exists. And so for that, if nothing else, I think he deserves a lot of credit. Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, Habermas in a nutshell, very short. Thank you.